Hello and welcome to the Animation Industry Podcast. My name is Terry and you can help support this podcast on my Patreon. The link for that is in the description of this chat. This week I'm chatting with Aaron Augenblick, animator, director, producer, and founder of Brooklyn-based Augenblick Studios. In our chat, he shares how he pivoted from adult comedy shows like Super Jail and Teenage Euthanasia, which he's been known for, to educational kids shows with his new show called City Island, which is now airing on PBS. He's also going to share his secret sauce to successful pitch packages, as well as the entire four plus year process City Island went through from his original idea to making it all the way on PBS and everything in between. So without further ado, let's jump in. Hello, Aaron. Welcome. Welcome back. A hundred episodes later since you were on to the podcast. Absolutely. Uh, Terry, I'm so happy to be here. I love the podcast. I'm a big fan and I love talking to you about animation. Great. Well, that's how we're going to talk about animation. So that's perfect. Actually, do you want to give like maybe a little quick recap for maybe people who didn't listen 100 episodes ago of, uh, you know, just just like a Cole's notes of your career journey and how you ended up here, starting from being born to producing. Uh, Start, we're starting with birth. OK, starting with birth. Cole's notes, though. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what were what were we talking about last time we talked? What? How Teenage many years ago was 100? Swamp it was about boy. teenage euthanasia and swamp boy. Yeah, gotcha. Indeed. Okay, so this is a very different topic with PBS Kids. It's exciting. Um, what, oh, so you want like a recap of my entire existence? Well, I mean, just you know, <laughs> career highlights. You know, where you career started, highlights. how you got to okay. where you are. Um, my name is Aaron Augenblick. I uh, have always been a cartoonist for as long as I can remember. Uh, I, and that is true. Seems like I, because people go, "Hey, when did you start cartooning?" I mean, I, was it the same for you, Terry? Uh, yeah, where you you yeah. just were sort of always drawing, right? I mean, my kindergarten teacher was basically telling me to stop drawing. So, oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that that's it. It is funny that the thing that you would get in trouble for became the only important thing. Right? You've the, done only, the only in way your you life. make a living. <laughs> Everybody, all your teachers are like mad at you, and like I know I it's really my funny. Calculus teacher was literally taking my notes and cutting out my doodles, and then and giving my notes back i will say them. it's funny that you know i've gotten lucky that i've always had very supportive people around me you know from my parents to teachers i think it like luckily i think i i, I have always been at least a little good at drawing so people would see through the fact that i was like drawing funny pictures of the principal or <laughs> you know dumb you know cartoons of you know things that i had seen you know on tv the day before whatever they would kind of see through and be like oh this is actually really good you know they'd be like oh <laughs> that thing that i just confiscated from you you know you, do you do that a lot you, like you seem to like be good at this so i, I all along I, I i would say i've been very lucky to have supportive people and and not everyone i know is like that i've i've know a lot of people whose parents you know oh you, when you know do that on the side get a real job first uh you know i i i i, I you know i i, I believe you had an yeah. experience like that too yeah, right? yeah i mean it was kind of the opposite for me where i had to like almost you know uh make a big risk and and yeah. jump into animation having not done it for so long because i was so closed off to it so it's really yeah. good to hear that you know you you experienced a lot of support through your career and now you're here <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, you know, so, so yeah, I've always, I've always had some supportive parents and, you know, I guess to loop it back into my origin story, you know, I always drew comics. I always loved, I always loved animation. I was always entranced by animation. Um, and uh, I was honestly doing animation even at a very young age. Um, you know, when I was a little kid, I was doing like, um, actually st early stop motion. I would do like claymation, like with Play-Doh. I would like had the, you know, house video camera and I would like press the button really fast to try to make claymation. And I was doing like little early digital animations because my dad was always a computer guy. Even early on, I had like an Apple IIe and I would do digital animations. And I even did like little summer programs, uh, at school where I got to do traditional animation. So, um, always did animation always did comics went to SVA uh briefly worked at MTV after SVA um met a lot of great people learned a ton but that cemented the idea that I never wanted to work inside of a giant corporation again um I didn't really 
see it as a fruitful experience working mm -hmm. at Viacom headquarters. Um, so I started my own animation studio at a very young age. Um, I think I was maybe 22 when I started my studio um, here in Brooklyn. Uh, very, very small space in Brooklyn. Never had any, I, I literally have never had any uh, investors. Uh, I've always just cobbled together whatever money I might have. Very, very low overhead, small studio. I'm in my fourth space, all in the neighborhood of Dumbo in Brooklyn. That always just gets a little, little bigger or evolves um, over time. And uh, we just, you know, I did everything the hard way. I'll say that. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was, you know, doing little job here, little job there. Little job leads to a little bit of a bigger job. I think our first big um, uh, leap into becoming an actual valid studio was we did a show called Shorties Watching Shorties for Comedy Central. And that was the first TV series we did. And that was based on the fact that the creator of the show, um, Eric Brown, had seen some of our festival pieces, some like little festival cartoons and was like, oh, I like this. And it's kind of like a show, you know, he's like, I just got greenlit to make a show for Comedy Central and I have no idea how to make animation. <laughs> uh, could you do it? And I was like, yeah, sure. Not having any idea how to make an animated series, but I figured it out. Uh, and then that uh, that show led to a show called Wonder Chosen, uh, which I think was was good for us because it sort of established our worldview to a degree. Um, <laughs> and it's still to this day, you know, people like I was uh, just at the PBS Summit, which I think we'll talk about in a little bit, um, where I had people be like, I, I literally had somebody came up to me and I signed a, a Wonder Chosen DVD at the PBS wow. Producer Summit because I was like, hey, I just want to say I'm a huge Wonder Chosen fan that changed my life. Can you sign this? So I think to this day, Wonder Chosen is something that we're associated with um, as far as the type of animation that we do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Wonder Chosen led to uh, Super Jail, uh, 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 which led to Ugly Americans. Um, we've done a show called The Jellies, uh, Death Hacks, uh, Teenage Euthanasia, uh, and most recently, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot about this um, in this meeting, is we had a, uh, a focus uh, in the past few years on kids animation because it's something I hadn't done enough of and honestly and I'm curious what you think about this Terry um, I feel like some of the most interesting and daring work is now being done in kids animation yeah. uh, I'm becoming a little disappointed by adult animation that I'm seeing it's feeling a little cookie cutter it's not feeling as groundbreaking as it was maybe 10 years ago we're seeing a lot of repetition of the same kind of adult format uh, whereas kids shows are all over the place. There's some crazy stuff happening in kids shows. Oh. Um, you know, any, anything from obviously like Adventure Time to Bluey to City of Ghosts. I mean, there's like some incredible things happening. Uh, Oni, I really was into. I mean, there's just like really cool stuff. Um, you know, on, on, on PBS, it's like any like Wild Kratz and, uh, you know, uh, 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 uh Alma's way, Eleanor. I mean, there's just really cool stuff happening that just like they're trying stuff. And yeah. I like seeing that. And I always like to be trying new stuff. So got really interested in kids animation and created uh, my first full uh, kids show, which is called City Island, which has been on uh, PBS Kids uh, for about six months now, like six, seven months now. So it's been a pretty wild journey. Yeah, wow. Congratulations on, on all that. And also City Island. How does it feel, you know, uh, summing up your whole life in the last uh, two, two minutes to where to where you are? It kind of sounds like you've you've lived the life of a snowball kind of rolling down a hill a little bit. Does that make sense? Like you just keep building and building uh, on top? Only if the snowball was <laughs> to crash. Uh, go bigger and then smaller and then bigger and then smaller, oh, but always remain relatively the same size okay so it's not like it's not <laughs> for like 24 years i'm well, sure there's curious, a snowball cause... that's going downhill that that experience happened but i would say that's okay because a lot of people they they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger i don't know yeah, I mean, we've yeah, gotten yeah. slightly bigger and and bigger conceptually you know because we have like a very large global team now that works but uh, we we never set out to be like a giant company that just okay. like churns out like a hundred shows and we've always meant to be a boutique studio that just makes the shows that we're interested nice. in. yeah i'm asking because last time i remember you just renovated i think your office coming mm -hmm. out of out of covid and whatnot yeah. but you know what is your philosophy on an animation career because you know the the typical 
uh animation studio whatever wants to get bigger and bigger and bigger sure. and, and do they you no know, well i don't know I, I, I don't know do, right you know to to kind of cut those <laughs> those those lull times right so you know what is your overall sure. philosophy with running you know you have your own studio now you yeah. you've worked on tons of creative projects now you've you've dived into a new uh kind of part of the industry that you weren't in before with children's media what is what is your you know what keeps you going at the end of the day is it the drive to do animation is it the drive to like build a a studio that supports you know the people that you work mm. with is it to try new things like what what keeps you excited after all these years uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, 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 I've always been a creator first, uh, business person second, uh, mm. as my accountant can attest. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's like, we, we've done, we've done great financially, but it's just like, as far as like, you know, the worldview of the studio, you know, we've always led creatively and I've always seen myself more like, uh, you know, a, a, a directorial studio or a creative uh, company than a corporation uh, that's out to expand and, you know, uh, take over the industry. You know yeah. what I mean? So um, for me, you know, it's always doing the most interesting projects. And honestly, I, I think one of the things that makes me a little different than a lot of my colleagues that own really awesome studios out there, whether they're independently owned or they're corporate studios. But I, I, I like, I, I like, and I can't not have a creative hand in our productions. Yeah. So, you know, for example, with city Island, you know, that's not just a new endeavor for our company. It's literally a show I created that I'm the showrunner of. Right. And, you know, I'm literally the one that uh, is leading the writer's room, uh, directing the actors, uh, you know, working with the animators, the designers. Uh, I'm mixing the audio. So I have a great need to make animation. I love to make animation. It is my favorite thing. Um, and more importantly, I love to make animation with my friends. You know, so I like to have direct contact, you know, I'm look the way this new studio that you mentioned that we built, it's, it's a room with a bunch of people in it, right. All working together in one room. And, you know, there's one of the things I learned in MTV, you know, I, I moved up the ranks fairly fast. Um, and, you know, it's like, you're in a room with other animators. I don't know if this, it's like this, you know, in, in California, it probably is. Um, but like you're in a room with other animators and you're having a good time. And then if you get good enough, they put you in a, in a room where they close the door and you're by yourself, you know yeah, what I mean? Right. And you have a stack of, you know, things to do and, you know, and by yourself. And then like maybe people knock on the door and they say, hey, I, I want to ask your opinion of something. Okay, thank you very much. And they close the door behind them. You know, so I, it felt, I felt very disconnected. And like the moment, the, the higher up I went, like, cause I started out as a PA, then I was doing layout, then I was doing design. Then eventually I was directing. I directed on the show Daria. Um, and by the time I was directing, that's, that was what it was, was I was in a room by myself that the door was closed and, and I never really saw that many people and it was not only stressful, but it wasn't, didn't feel overly collaborative. So when I left, so I knew like, oh, the higher up I go here, the more alone I'm going to be. <laughs> so when I started my studio, it's always been a studio where it's extremely collaborative, right? Um, so it is a room full of people saying, Hey, you, hey, that new that new design, you have that ready yet? Oh, wow, that looks great. Or like, oh, is that oh, his hat is red now? Okay, let me just so whatever. So it's a room full of people yelling at each other, <laughs> listening to music, drawing, yelling at each other. I mean, that's my favorite aspect of animation is a room full of like incredibly talented people yeah. all being inspired by each other. That's my favorite thing. So that's sort of the core, I think, of the studio that I protect. So like the like uh, um, I would say fin financial stability of the studio to protect that is important to me, right? So I try to keep a low overhead so we can take risks, so we can try new things, so we can only do the things that we want to do. And low overhead, honestly, that's my biggest advice. It's a, it's a very boring conversation to have probably, but when people say like, oh, I want to start a studio, it's like, keep your overhead low. Because the moment that you have like a huge overhead, oh, I got this great space right in midtown. I'm right in the middle of Hollywood, whatever. Like that means you have people 
that you're going to owe a lot of money to, whether it's real estate, whether it's investors. And if you don't, the less people that you owe money and favors to, the more freedom that you have. Yeah, 100%. I want to follow up on something you said before about the collaborative, collaborative, collaborative environment. You know, that almost sounds like a core competency of your your studio to create kind of unique animation that other studios may not be able to because you have this extra collab going on that mm -hmm. other studios don't. Do you see that as like something that really helps your your stories shine and your animation shine? I, th I think it's, it's the key to everything that we do is <laughs> that like we, you know, we like... It's not um, just one singular person's vision that a, a lot of other cogs need to fit into the machine. Um, and, you know, it's it's not, again, uh, a company led by algorithms or financial decisions or trend marketing. It, it, it really is a group of people that, you know, all like animation and and generally like the same kinds of animation um and the differences actually get pretty interesting too but um but you know all of these people together and when we have new ideas you know we get together and talk about them and like oh here's something i want to try or here's a you know here's a here's a new approach to you know the way we either make animation the ideas that we're developing uh the system we're using like it's a bunch of people you know collaborating together on that and and, it, and i do truly believe that the collaboration is the key to all these great things i mean don't you think i mean you're a student of animation don't you see that throughout the history of animation i mean people like to highlight the idea of these like you know singular geniuses yeah. but you know it's like you know walt disney wouldn't be walt disney without a uh, byworks and you know looney tunes would have been looney tunes if it wasn't that what do they call it termite terrace where they were all in the room together like you know throwing these ideas out about how cartoons could work totally. like yeah. i just feel like the collaborative process is is just so important well i think so especially because animation is largely driven by story and story is largely improved by having multiple influences and people work. That's a good on. point. Um, I wanted to also reflect back on something that you said earlier, you know, coming from Wonder Shows in and Super Jail and all these, you know, kind of highly crude, I don't know if crude's the right word, you know, adult risky humor. <laughs> uh, I thought you, I thought the word humor. was C-R-E-W-E-D, like there were a lot of crew. No, you mean C-R-U-D-E. -C gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I've, I've watched them all and I've loved them all. They've also yes. been like influential <laughs> in developing my own humor. That's nice. How did you uh, pitch something that was so opposite you know children's like sure. preschool media is complete opposite do you i'm i'm actually kind of facing this right now because I, somehow i've locked myself oops i just hit something somehow i've locked myself into like preschool media and i want to like mm -hmm. jump into adults so sure. um, like one of my plans is to like work on a adult project on the side when i have some time but mm -hmm. how did you convince people like hey you know you know me from such adult projects right. now i want to make a very wholesome uh, educational preschool sure. show with a light bulb. Uh, I, I what helped a lot was um, that um, the person I pitched to at PBS was Linda Semensky, um, who if, if if you know Linda, she's pretty legendary in the industry, and um, she was somebody I just knew from New York Animation community, um, and she, you know we've always kind of, I, I met her literally my thesis screening at SBA. She introduced herself and said, hi, I'm Linda. And she, at the time she was probably, that would have been when she was at Nickelodeon dealing with like, you know, all the crazy Nickelodeon shows um, and uh, all the really influential Nickelodeon shows. And um, the uh, fact that I stayed in touch with her over the years, she was a fan, kind of understood my voice as an animator, as an artist. So by the time I pitched her this idea, because I pitched it all around and, you know, I went out to LA and, you know, this was pre-pandemic when I was pitching City Island. So I would, did the whole, you know, went to everywhere from like Warner Brothers to Disney. And, you know, I had a really good meeting at Disney. They were really into it, but they were like, um, you know, this is really cool. But they were like, honestly, this like feels like it was made in Brooklyn. It feels like a little, it feels like a hip show like it's like <laughs> and they're like disney's a lot of things it's you know heartwarming it's beautiful uh it's it's moving uh but it's rarely hip 
We are very <laughs> rarely hip. So they were like, but you know who you should talk to? You know who's hip is Linda Semensky. They're like, you oh, should wow. talk to her at PBS Kids. She's really cool. Um, so I was like, oh, right, Linda. So I went and talked to Linda, pitched her, and she was like really into it immediately. Um, and uh, so – Pitching her, it was her and Natalie Engel, and both of them just are cool. Like, they're cool people. And honestly, everyone at PBS Kids is cool. I mean, like, they're just, like, I, maybe it's an East Coast thing. I don't know. I mean, West Coast is great, too. But I don't know. I just, the, everyone I meet there, you know, it's like from our producer, uh, Gavin uh, Langford, Adriano now is, is you know, head of all the programming, and Sarah DeWitt's really cool. Like, everyone over there is just, they're cool people, and you talk to them, and they like animation, you know. So I think the idea that, like, um, oh, you're the like, you know, late night animation guy. Um, I think it was more that they were just looking at the content for what it was and they liked it. And they're like, oh, this is really cool. And you have a track record, you know how to be funny. I think that's another key huh. with, at, you know, with PBS, you know, they're all about the curriculum. They're all about the education, but they're also all about being entertaining. And I know that that's always been a North star for them is that they're not out to just be teaching lessons. They are, it's so crucial that they are entertaining and that they can draw kids in and have characters that kids connect with and jokes that they laugh at. And I think, you know, look, when, when the seed is planted with something like Sesame Street, um, which is still to this day, one of the funniest shows that's ever been on television. It is absolutely a hilarious show. Um, that's the seed that was planted, but it's also so educational. So the fact that, you know, it's with PBS kids, which puts so much importance on storytelling and comedy in addition to, uh, curriculum for kids. I think it allowed me to sort of enter into sort of the side door into this like kids world that I hadn't really been doing too much of interesting wow <laughs> um so it sounds like connections uh persistence uh knowledge of the industry and just yeah. you know uh building up your own animation voice really really helped you get into this i'm wondering also you know what is what is the secret to putting like together this pitch because you know you have a bunch of experience doing shows how did you create the secret sauce to make sure that this pitch would become a show because it's got a lot of elements it almost sounds like an anti-joke like how many city people can screw in a light bulb or something like, <laughs> you know, funny. so, funny. so like if you were to pitch this show to me right now, cause it's, yeah. it's like a crazy concept when you think about it. it That's good. Um, what would you say? You know, like, <laughs> I'm just curious. Cause I love pitching. I have yeah. a number of pitches that are going around town right now. And, and I'm just, I'm always curious in how other people, you know, pitch their stuff. I would say the first rule is to make sure you're not pitching it like it's a crazy concept. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, guys, this is a crazy concept. You're gonna love it. <laughs> I, 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 it's, it's actually, it's, it's, it's funny, but it's true. You know, I learned a lesson early on. Um, David Wayne is somebody that I collaborate with a lot, and um, you know, we did uh, the ten with him and Super Jail, and you know, we actually developed a couple things together. We did a pilot for IFC that ended up not going, but I, you know, when I, I was out pitching with David Wayne, and I did a couple of pitches that didn't go that well and he afterward after one of them he was like hey you know you know in future pitches like don't tell them it's a world where anything can happen yeah yeah <laughs> he goes that concept the world where anything can happen is something that writers like animators like but no one else does like, <laughs> like because to a network that means like oh it's chaos like networks like shows with a focus you know mm. it's like it's about this you know they don't like okay here's a show about chaos because like for example like you know the simpsons you know it's uh, probably one of the most important shows in the history of animation they i'm certain they pitch that show as okay here's a show it's about a family there's a dumb dad there's a mom that's like all put upon, bratty kid, nerdy sister, you know, uh, wacky baby. You know, they didn't, they pitched The Simpsons. They didn't pitch Springfield. 
right? They didn't say we're going to have this show where there's going to be a hundred character, a hundred, eight hundred characters, it's gonna be 800 characters. They're all going to go to outer people. space. We're going to have episodes where we murder people and then they come alive again. And we're going to have these Halloween things. We're going to have this. We're going to do be political, but we're also going to be sharply comic, but we're also going to be yeah. heartwarming. They never did that. They weren't like we're going to have this infinitely huge show right um they were like oh it's a show about this kind of silly family that yeah. fights with each other so i think the key to city island was to focus it on the characters and okay. and it is true i mean in the end like it's about watt and wendy and their friendship and their experiences uh living in this very very friendly city and going on adventures and learning about life right so that's when, what the yeah, show is yeah. about so when you're pitching it you know you are you having like the classic here's here's watts character page and here's a description about him and his wants and needs and his relationships yeah. and blah 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 and like here's here's a snapshot of the city etc like it's a classic pitch deck with just kind yeah, of yeah i that... mean I, my advice would be no matter how high another thing is networks rarely like high concept anything yeah. right again that's something animators love they yeah. love high concept i love high concept everything i've ever pitched is high concept but it's always about the characters. It's always about why do I, and especially in kids programming, and you see that on every show on PBS Kids, that like, why do I want to spend time with these characters? Like, why do I want to, you know, hang out yeah. with these characters? Why do I want these characters to my friends? And you see that in, in the history of, of, you know, kids programming is they tend to be, like, it's like, look at those like heartwarming videos you see of like little kids like with, kermit the frog hugging yeah, yeah, yeah. kermit the frog and you want to cry because they're like i love you kermit and kermit's like oh, i love you too you know and oh, it's like, wow, it's like, it's like <laughs> I, can, I can do cartoons the uh but the, <laughs> but but seriously like it's like and i think well here you know i i did a you know to this day there's a, a frame picture in my parents house of um you know, a family portrait that I drew when I was, I think, like one or two, like it's just like little stick figures. But it's like my mom, my dad, my right when my brother's born, it's like a baby, and then Bugs Bunny. Wow. You know, like I literally thought Bugs Bunny lived in my house. I felt that close to Bugs Bunny. I genuinely saw him as just as real as anyone in my family, anyone of my friends. And where does that come from? You know, that doesn't come from. I'm going to have a world where there's a rabbit that can do anything and the world itself has no rules either. So the thing, a thing can fall off a cliff and then they could think and the gravity doesn't have to operate in the ways that gravity actually operates. No, it's like, oh, it's a really funny rabbit, you know, that's sarcastic. And you know what I mean? It's like, so it's more about like the character of these people, you know, you know, Daffy Duck, uh, you know, this, this, you know, duck that like everything terrible happens to him, but he has this weird fortitude and this weird fits of rage. It's like there's all these character elements that are make the Looney Tunes interesting, you oh, know. Really? Um, the so, idea of Kermit is – like I probably relate to Kermit more than any other character because it's essentially my life at the studio. It's like how do I <laughs> how do I re remain uh, upbeat while I am running this <laughs> entertainment company that is in yeah. a constant sense of chaos? Like, So I love those character moments. So for me with City Island, it was all about focusing on that, about Watt, Wendy, their friend group, yeah. um, Watt's dad, uh, Frank Lloyd Light. Like it's like all these – characters they're the ones that i think you focus on i think that's the way you you would pitch a show so let, i love what you just said but let me put you on the spot a little bit you know why would i want to spend time you know i'm a producer you're pitching the show yeah you've got everything thought out you've got this world you you, you know you've got the character etc why do i want to spend why do why do kids or myself want to spend time with with watt and wendy in your show um what you know, it, it's no secret that uh, Watt is like the most autobiographical character I've created, and I just, I, I think it, it's 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 nice for me to show run a show where I completely understand and relate to this character. And it's funny because early on, no one else did. Like, I mean, they liked him. Oh, he's funny. He's a little light bulb. And, you know, he's got all these big ideas. But, you know, early on, you know, PBS was really good about being like, well, why do I want to hang out with this character? Because, you know, uh, you know, know-it-all characters can be very annoying. 
You know what I mean? Taking it as a personal attack, like this. A little when they when they were like, "You don't really understand what," and I was like, "Well, I completely understand what. Like, I totally understand what." But it was like, (laughs) I think the key, like, in early on, I was kind of thinking of him of like, "Oh, he's this character that has all these big ideas and he helps the town." But what one of the things that PBS added, and I think helps with my ability to relate to what, and I think the audience's ability to relate to what, is Watt's humility, um, I and the fact that he is rarely right. You know, like the most of the seeds of our storytelling is about what assuming he understands a given situation and then learning, oh, I didn't understand it at all. Like I didn't understand the scope of it. I had a misapprehension about something. Um, there's much more for me to learn. Um, and that drives the storytelling. And and I, I like to think I'm a humble person and I and I relate to that about what I relate to a character that has really wants to do things they want to create things they want to help out they want to meet people i'm like that but things rarely go the way he planned them to go and i find that relatable and i think that when people relate to what um i think i hopefully that's what they relate to because you know it's hard to relate to characters where everything goes well because no matter how successful anyone is i think we all see ourselves as struggling right it's like you know all of us you know like people are like oh wow you own your own studio and you know that must be amazing and i'm like i feel like every day i'm like you know fighting for my life you know that's life it's like that's what that's what existence is is like you always want something a little bit more than what you've accomplished or you want to you know expand on what you're doing or try new things or meet new people and i think watt's constant quest to connect with his world and understand his world and succeed um against all odds i mean he's like a little kid he's eight years old and he's the one that would say like oh i'm gonna do this like oh i'm gonna you know because i want to make my own comic book company i want to do this which is something i did when i was eight and it's like it's just so crazy but i think the fact that he does very quickly realize like oh really oh that's what it is oh okay now i understand i i I hope that's relatable that sounds really kind of um i don't know the right word but like self-reflective to have a show that's kind of about you sure at the same time how does that how does that feel do you feel like extra personally tied to this project versus other i do projects? i do I, I i really believe this is the most fulfilling project i've ever done because wow. it's also um you know Sometimes I I say, you know, (laughs) it's like we're working for the forces of good, not evil anymore. (laughs) Not that (laughs) Adult Swim is evil, but it's a dark comedy. It's a a lot of the a lot of the late night comedies that we work on tend to be sarcastic or you know, um, you know, nihilist or uh, pessimistic, and it's just so refreshing, so exciting, and honestly, in some ways, more true to my personality to have a show that feels optimistic um and inclusive um that you know when i'm making city island it's just it's 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 just it's fun it's exciting and i think that there you know optimism and positivity not to get corny it's it's infectious you know it's pervasive and like you know doing a show like city island like everyone that works in the show like they're charmed by it. And like, I, I've never worked on a show where more people didn't say like, Oh, this was so much fun. Or like, Oh, I love these characters. Or like, Oh, this character's just like me. Or like, this is, this is where I would hang out in city Island, you know? Like, so I feel like, you know, there's something about doing a show like this, like you said, both like with a character that I relate to and doing a show that like, educationally has such a positivity to it because you know this is a show it's the curriculum is civics you know but at at, you know and that sounds like like well that sounds like a lot of fun but it is because (laughs) when you break it down it's about community and it's about how do things work you know what are the people in you know in your town who are these people you know how do you know how 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 does how does a city run and you know what is what are the kinds of crazy adventures that you could go on in any community like that's fun that's exciting you know and that's it's a, a nice intro hopefully we're introducing kids to like all these new ideas that are positive about about the world and not because it's dark times totally, it's yeah. dark times out there so for people to watch a show that feels optimistic about the world and especially about you know neighborhoods and towns and cities like hopefully that we're putting out a force of good in the world 
Well, I love that. And I, it, to me, it just comes across watching it, all those those cute moments and, and like real moments. I'm wondering, though, you said you, it was four years. It started pre-pandemic when you were pitching this. What happened in those four years to get to this point finally? You know, you, you pitch yeah. it, somebody says yes, Linda says yes. Yeah, and I'm sh- I'm sure you went through lawyer lawyering for a while, mm-hmm. which is a fun process, and then yeah. you know gathering a team. Like maybe just you know what what were some of the hardships that you went through to get to the point where now it's on air? Um, the first year was uh, the first year. You know, the thing is with PBS, like they're very careful about everything they develop, so it yeah, takes yeah, time. Yeah. Um, so the first year was just developing was just de- developing the concept. It was like, you know, because look, when, when I first created the show, it didn't have a very specific curriculum. It wasn't a civic show. It was mm. more of like a problem solving show about a community. And over the course of that year, that's when, you know, you know, PBS introduced the idea that like, oh, this feels like it could be a civic show. And that's something we're interested in. And mm. and I was like, oh, that's great. You know, because that's interesting that they said yes to the idea when. Yeah, the it's rare, I think. Does that I, mean I, they brought in consultants? Like yeah, consultants I, I do to... think. I think that uh, that's a rare experience in PBS. Mm. I could be wrong, but from everything I've seen, there's usually a more fully baked curriculum. Um, And again, I got kind of lucky, you know, with, you know, the development team at PBS where, you know, they were into this show even before it had a curriculum. So they, once they said like, Oh, it's about a city and you're really interested in all these, you know, crazy processes in a city, like the subway and, you know, the mayor's office and, you know, the way cities run like this feels like it could be civics and i was like that's great i would love to do that so um the first year was all about honing the curriculum and and pretty quickly they introduced me to liz hind who's our curriculum advisor um and she literally wrote the curriculum for civics for pbs so she was like the best one and she's like someone i find endlessly inspiring and um you know, honestly, a lot of the ideas for episodes came from just me hanging out with Liz and saying like, oh, you know, pretend I'm like a kid that's, t- she's a teacher, P- pretend I'm a kid that doesn't know anything about civics, which I don't, and uh, <laughs> teach me, <laughs> give me an overview of what the course would be like. And she's like, oh, well, there's this and this and this. And I would be like, oh, that's interesting. So geography, so you're saying geography could be something more conceptual, like just the idea that the world is bigger than, you know, the world in your town. Oh, yeah. There- so like there's all these conversations we had that sparked episodes so it always started curriculum first but that was all the first year how so how intense is that first year are you working yeah. full time on this in development no, is this daily. like a no. I'll, I'll do something on monday and send it and come back two mondays 100%. later and, yeah okay. it was a lot of part-time it was a lot of like i think i believe we were doing jellies at the time uh-huh. and um we, it was a lot of just a little bit here, a little bit there, and honing it, doing a lot of writing about the characters. For, I mean, I don't know that they had a friend group in the beginning. I think it was all about Watt and Wendy. I remember early on, they were like, most of their friends are like old people. <laughs> Because it was like, I knew I had Watt and Wendy, but it was like, oh, I liked like Carrie the mail truck and, you know, I liked uh, Detritus the, the the bag and like I, and the mayor and like I, most of the people that I had as supporting characters were all like adults. And they were like, what what are their friends like? And that's when I was like, oh, that's interesting. Who would their friends be? And I was like, oh, it'd be funny if there's a marker named Mark and, you know, we could have a salt and pepper shaker and they're twins and, you know, Lydia could be a hat. And like, so I started thinking about that and like what makes a friend group and a lot of that's diversity you know and it was like okay how can these characters be different but also like really get along so that all happened the first year so it was like very that, is, that includes wrong. like art style and everything else like did you the also style have- was figured out because i always yeah. i always you know the first thing i did when i conceived of the idea and all, which again was like oh there's a light bulb named watt and a kite named windy and they live in a town called city island um the first person I went to is Gemma Coral, who's the art director. And I was just a mega fan of Gemma's. And you just uh, message her on like Twitter or something and be like, hi. Well, I knew her. I, I luckily had worked with her. We did a, uh, she does comics for a, a comic series, a political comic series called The Nib. And we animated The Nib. So we actually got to uh, animate right, a right, couple right. of her cartoons for The Nib. And I don't know if I ever even spoke to her but we did work together. You know what I mean? It was a lot of emails and and things like that. So um, 
when it came time to this, she at least we actually had each other's email and knew each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I, maybe the first verbal conversation we had might have been this. Um, and um, I just pitched her the idea and she was like oh i'm so down for this so she did a bunch of sketches and honestly the first sketches are not that different than where it is now like it's very very close and you can see it if you, if you go to uh city island pbs uh on uh, uh instagram we've posted a couple of her original sketches and you'll see nice. they're very close so that was the first year the second yeah. year was writing so the second year now was okay let's write the scripts for the pilots uh and again that was like just deep dive development it was like a year of just script writing and writing bios for the characters and just and deep this diving. is also kind of like a part-time thing too part-time thing Actually. so the third year and now we're in the pandemic yeah was the first year where we were actually making the pilot so that was the year of like actually producing the anime so we ended up producing three animated pilots that's around when we migrated to becoming a short um why so, would you make three three different pilots Just so like we had uh pitched like i don't know like 10 or 20 different episodes and then they were like, oh, we have this, we're really excited about shorts right now. Would you be interested in making shorts, uh, not 22 minutes? And I was like, yeah, I love shorts. I mean, like as an animation fan, I think shorts are sometimes the purest form of of cartoon. So originally and, you pitched this like 52, 22 minute episodes. Of Bo, yeah, uh, really traditional. And then they were like three years in, they're like, can we, Let's make can shorts. We, can we do shorts? Well, we like, also, like, to be honest, they knew that we could have a little like more creative autonomy with shorts you know it can be a little more experimental because honestly i don't think it's as as big of a, a risk financially for them yeah, so yeah, yeah. they knew that like it's a very new kind of show is a fairly experimental show for them so they and and shorts have been like this like growing trend uh for them uh you know based on the way people are encountering uh cartoons being less tv uh based and more streaming on demand tablets phones like shorts are becoming very very popular incredibly popular for them so um i pitched a bunch of things so what they did was instead of making like one big pilot they made three three minute pilots Makes sense. uh which was i think really beneficial for us because you know each pilot was like um sort of a different depiction of city island in a good way like it kind of showed where we could go with the show you know like it was like i you know i i think i'm trying to remember now but i i think it was like um you know one was like took place at the park cuz i was like oh we can have like you know plants <laughs> which a lot of people think plants don't exist in new york city and you know i was like oh we can have like you know plants and a lake and all that stuff and flowers you know so we had like a thing and then like one was like really city based where they went on the subway together you know and then one took place in like a town hall like in the mayor's office and like more about like the government so like it was kind of three slices of life in a city and i think that was really beneficial so that was the third year and then the fourth year we made the series wow and it took one year to do the whole the whole series yeah yeah, we did all. Is that, is that an unusually long like, development run? Like, not for PBS. Hmm, okay. Things take time for PBS. They wow. do, but again, it's you know because they're they're being very careful about what they produce. You know, it's like, and also with PBS, what I, another the things I like about them is that like, you know, if they go to the trouble of making a show, they like take care of it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like you're seeing a lot of networks that will remain, remain nameless that they'll make a show and then, oh, it's not doing that well. Boom. Canceled. You right. know what I mean? Or they'll, oh, you know what? We'll only air six out of 12 episodes because it's not worth it. You know, like it's like it, it's it's I, I, I do miss. I feel like when I started, there was like a little like there was something a little more parental about a network like they were they were sort of fostering the creativity of the creators the teams um and over time not not to be too critical but you're seeing networks that don't really support the shows as closely and you're seeing a lot more i mean most shows i feel like new shows get one season if that which was well, I mean, I feel like Netflix is kind of uh, you said it, didn't they? Not me. 
I, yeah, I've right. done so that with Netflix They're like, shows. oh, this show isn't getting the, the audience yeah. we wanted in the first three weeks or whatever, canceled. And then turns out yeah. it's a massive hit. And all, yeah, anyways, whatever. Um, okay, yes. so th that's, that's an incredible experience. How do you feel after, you know, you put all this effort into kind yeah. of changing the storytelling you were telling uh, yeah. four years later, produced the whole series. And how does it feel now that it's been on, on air for the last six months? It, it's incredible. Um, I have to say, you know, you know, another major component of this process that I should mention, you know, is uh, that like my animation director, Katie Went, uh, she was actually like, like to loop all the way back to our conversation in the beginning about our studio, you know, it was a group of us, through, you know, when I pitched the idea of like, oh, I want to do a show. I mean, it literally was me saying, I want to do a show about a city where everything's alive. That was my pitch that was the first pitch and oh what if how would we do a show where everything's alive and then it came a lot of just conversation a lot of like well you do this or that and you know what you know different approaches so it was just a creative conversation with like a bunch of my favorite uh animators and 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 writers in a room all throwing ideas out there and katie was there from the very beginning and the very very first meeting that we had about it and she's been the animation director all through the entire process i just laid out from you know development to you know a, a pilot to um the series uh so that's been great so the two of us being able to make this show the way we wanted to make it you know all along yeah. like we always had this vision of doing this show that had you know that felt very very cartoony, very expressive, very uh, influenced by like our favorite cartoons from, you know, Richard Scarry to UPA um, to Underground Comics, like just all of these influences, just, you know, 60s, uh, a lot of 60s animation is influenced, like 60s Disney is a big influence. Um, Old Fleischer, obviously, is a huge influence on the show. Um, you know, everything from, you know, Betty Boop's experiences in the city where, you know, trash cans come alive and you know windows have eyeballs in them like all that kind of stuff like just you know and and then obviously the sesame street influence is huge and these are all our favorite things so so the fact that we could craft the show ourselves it's rare that showrunners have their own animation studio so we had this extra level of autonomy on what we were doing um so that's been great so being able to collaborate with katie uh over the four years on the show and make the show that we always dreamed of making was a big deal and then uh, you know a lot of this again to loop all the way back to the beginning is like being able to make a really cool show with all my favorite people is like such a treat and like i met uh a guy named tunde adabimpe um when i was at mtv and he's the lead singer of uh, tv on the radio uh and he's like a huge rock star i met him at mtv because people don't know uh Maybe he doesn't even want people to know he's an animator himself, a really amazing animator. And I met him at MTV because I was working on Daria and he was working on a show called Celebrity Deathmatch. And we met and just got along. And I went off and started an animation studio. He went off and became a world famous rock star. And then he was like, once we got the show picked up, uh, he was the first person I called and said, Tunde, is there any way you would ever do music for this show? I know you're busy. And I sent him cartoons and he was like, I'm so into this. Like, I'm down. Like, so wow. the fact that then Tunde did all the music from the theme song to original score for every episode um, is like huge, huge for me. So like all of these people, um, like I said, you know, it's like, all the people at PBS, you know, all the people here at the studio, Tunde doing music, and Jeremy Jusay, one of my oldest friends. I met him at SVA. He's my background director. I We've known each other for over 25 years, and he's doing all the crazy locations for City Island, all these amazingly deep uh, you know, Richard Scary esque city shots where you see a thousand buildings and a thousand vehicles and everything's alive. Like, you know, so I get to work with Jeremy. Like it's, it's just, it's, it's really, it's exciting. It's fun. And like I said, it's like, it's, it's very fulfilling because now it's like all of this stuff that I care so much about these influences like Fleischer and sixties Disney and all these things in some ways it matters. And in some ways it doesn't, because in the end it's, you know, baking the pie and put it out in the world and the kids are enjoying the pie. You know what I mean? Right. Like you're, you know, these, you know, they don't need to know the kids. signs of 
powder, like flour and butter. Yeah, exactly. The six year old kids that see it, they're just like, oh, this is super fun. It's like, I, this was so funny. And like, oh, this was so, the colors are so bright and I love it. And it's fun to watch. Like, and hopefully like all of our influences and all of our intent is just creating the product that they're enjoying. So they don't oh, need yeah. to know all these things and they'll never, they would never know all these things, you know? I mean, I, I love just listening to you talk about how exciting the creative process and the collaborative process and working with people you wanted to work with is. I yeah. mean, that sounds like a dream to me. Um, one question that came up in my mind is, and, and because uh, people ask me this quite frequently is, um, you know, they have a, they have a pitch idea, but they're yeah. afraid to share it because they're afraid other people are going to steal something. Sure. <laughs> so either they don't share it and they work on it forever or they share it, but they leave out so many details that it, it's just like, I don't really know what this is about. And they're yeah. like, but I can't tell you because somebody will steal this. What is your, I feel like I already know your take on what you're going to say, but what is your take on, <laughs> on that? <laughs> what do you think I'm going to say? I think you're going to say collaborate and share yeah. it and yeah. uh, you're going to make the idea better with people you trust. hundred percent. I, you know, I, I, that is like an int I'm surprised at the commonality of that opinion. I, I'm actually shocked by it. And I think it's because of the fact that I've spent, you know, over 20 years desperately trying anyone to look at the work that I make right, right? on every level. Yeah. In developing shows, in the shows that I've already made, um, in my own comics. I mean, just everything I've ever worked on, all I want is for people to look at it. So people that are afraid to show things to people, I'm very surprised at that. And look, there's a couple things. Like, you know, I, I, there's there are obviously a lot of horror stories out there um, of people whose ideas have been stolen or co-opted or ruined by the network. Like those stories happen. But, you know, you know, to, to, to use a cliche, like, you know, what is it? You, 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 you know, you, you miss a uh, hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Right. It's like, um, my feeling is the odds are in your favor that, you know, you need to get your work out there. You need everybody to see it and to be overly protective of it. it, it it's, it's not nearly as important as giving the world the opportunity to see your work. Right. And look, honestly, like there's a lot of, you know, there's, if you put it out there and people see it, there's, there's things you can do to protect yourself. Like, you know, it's like, you know, if, if, if you put something and you have a timestamp on anything, you have that proof that it was your idea first and that's easy. But honestly, like to be afraid for people to see your work is not going to help your work. And it's definitely not going to help, you know, your mission to have people enjoy it. So I would say, if you have an idea, you're scared to show people, don't be scared, get it out there, show it to people, pitch it, show it to your friends, show it to networks, show it to colleagues, just get people to see it, you know, and the best thing that could happen from that is that it gets made. Nice. Next time somebody asks me, I'm just going to point to this conversation then. <laughs> yeah, Thank I'm, you. I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Uh, like, I don't know. Maybe I'm overly reckless, but I just, I, I just, I just feel like the most important thing is being seen. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I understand the sentiment of you know protecting your ideas and not wanting to be stolen, but like, I'm also of the opinion like nobody's going to steal your idea. <laughs> yeah. And, and if it happens, then like, just come up with another one, I guess. I don't know. But then again, yeah. it didn't happen to me. So I can't say. That's cool. True. I mean, you know, we've talked so much about, you know, city, city island, your process, et cetera. I think one, one more thing you want to talk about was your, uh, the PBS kids producer summit that you went. Yeah. To. I just, I oh, just got back out of, out of educational animation right now. Yeah, totally. I, I, you know, I just wanted to say that, you know, you know, it, it, we we are you know it, it is an interesting time in 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 our in our in our world in our uh, industry uh, and and you know I think there's a lot of people talking about you know um, what's the direction that entertainment is taking and I, I'm hearing a lot of pessimism and I just I just wanted to say that I just got back from the PBS Producer Summit which is uh, an event they put on once a year where they put all of their creative teams together everybody it's like the all-star teams of every one of their shows all their greatest producers um, and they all get together in a room and just talk about um, you know shows talk about animated shows and education and and what are you know how are how are kids doing out there you know what i mean it's it's you know one of the exciting things about being a part of an 
a, a network like PBS Kids is they're a hugely empathetic network. I mean, their job is to entertain and educate, you know, children and, you know, their their research and data about, you know, what are how are kids feeling? How are they doing post pandemic? How are they learning? What are they what are they interested in? How are they experiencing cartoons? Um, and we talk a lot about that. They talk a lot about the new shows they're doing, new places they want to go in curriculum, and you know, both in like what are what are what are places we haven't gone before. That's very important to them, um, which is so exciting, um, because every other network is like, what could we do that was already a success before? So it's exciting to be in a room full of people being like, let's do something we've never done before. Wow, that's yeah. really great. Yeah. So. Um, just there was a lot of really great conversations and I just walked away feeling hugely inspired um, for the future of animation and a future of educational animation because they're just cooking up so many interesting things. Um, and I think that, you know, the future is bright. And I think that, you know, the one thing, you know, for all the people that are scared, because it's a scary time, it's a scary time for all things, but specifically animation. I don't know, Terry, if you're seeing this, but, you know, a lot of my, the people in, in our, you know, profession are scared, you know, it's like there's a lot of people are losing their jobs. A lot of shows are getting canceled. The mergers are just, you know, gutting the industry. But there's people out there that are interested in making new shows and making new programming and trying out new things. And the thing is, one thing I'll say that's that's a positive note to anyone that's feeling scared is people love to watch animation. They love to watch animation. And that is the one thing for all the changes that have happened in society that does not seem to change. And, not, you know, I, I, I have theories about, you know, cave paintings and the fact that people were animating with, you know, buffalo running and, you know, the fact that, you know, animation and, you know, cartooning and illustration and painting is one, one of the oldest things that we've ever conceived of as humans. And of course, we're still interested in that today because it's just eternal. Um, but people still like to watch animation and kids are watching animation like crazy. People are still reading books. That was an interesting data point that I learned over the past week is like books have never been more popular for some reason that's kind of cool games are huge and games are becoming really interesting the types of games people are making um so i i think the future is bright i think it's a it's it could be a, a tricky next few years but i think people should just be confident about the fact that you know kids adults want to watch cartoons be funny and scary and dramatic and uh that we should just keep making the cartoons and people the, the networks will figure out their mess <laughs> i feel like ending the chat on that no because it was such a great one animation is eternal i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah I'm it gonna is feel that feel that song um is there anything we didn't talk about that you wanted to share you know we've gone through basically your journey the, the whole yeah. process of making city island your philosophy on animation the optimism of animation is eternal etc is there anything we didn't talk about i think you, i hit it all i think, hit it all i think i i'm hoping you even hit on the, the purpose of the meaning of life earlier on <laughs> the meaning of life is interesting as well that's the city island is a very existential show there's a lot about life there's a lot about life there but yes no i i think i hit everything i i uh i i appreciate uh, this conversation, Terry, and I, and I, I'm very sincerely a big fan of the podcast. And I just feel like you have great conversations like this that are, are a little deeper than the, the typical, uh, talk about cartoons. And I, I just, I, it's really fun talking to you. Oh, well, thank you. It's nice to hear that reflected back at me as well. Cause that's what I, yeah. that's what I try to do. Cause I'm interested yeah. in animation just like you are. So, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the chat. Cool. Thanks Terry. Pleasure. Yeah. And if you're listening and you want to check out Aaron's work or say, Island, you can go to augenblickstudios.com or pbskids.org or at city Island PBS on Instagram to check out all those things. And that's all for now. So thank you so much for listening. Thanks Terry. Okay. Bye. <laughs>